Over the past 30 years, Final Fantasy games have featured waves upon waves of enemies. In the earlier days of the franchise, many of these enemies were quite derivative. The original Final Fantasy, for example, featured a roster that was full of goblins, wolves, ogres, zombies, dragons and gargoyles. But as Final Fantasy began to establish itself and the developers wanted to create larger and larger bestiaries, it opened the door for more unique creations to appear. Some of these, such as the Marlboro, Tombrays and Bombs, have even become so popular after their debuts that they've become codified and are deemed as quintessential Final Fantasy enemies. But for every one of these enemies, there have been plenty of others that after their debuts have been destined to remain in the doldrums of obscurity. And it's those enemies that we're going to run through today. So without further ado, here are seven of the most obscure monsters to have featured in mainline Final Fantasy games and we're going to kick things off with an incredibly weird abomination that was created for Final Fantasy VII. But quickly, before we do, an update on our collaboration with Lost in Cult. Last year we announced that we'd be working with Lost in Cult on their upcoming premium video game journal called Lock On. It will have a specific focus on Final Fantasy, featuring interviews with Hironobu Sakaguchi and Noboru Uematsu, and thoughtful analysis from the likes of Ben Starr, Lucy James, Tim Gettys, and me, as I'll be writing a piece about Final Fantasy 2. So far the campaign has been a huge success and this has led to Lost in Cult extending the deadline so that there's more opportunity for people to get their hands on the limited premium and deluxe editions which feature a stunning cover designed by Yoshitaka Amano. If this sounds of interest, be sure to visit the link in the description below for more information. Now Final Fantasy 7 features perhaps one of the strangest bestiaries in the history of the franchise and it's so extreme that this video could have quite easily been focused on that topic in isolation, which may be something we look into in the future. After all, this is a game that featured a literal house and also these things. But when narrowing it down to just one entry, it has to be the heavy tank. Found inside the reactor area of the optional Gongaga location, where the Titan material could be obtained, the heavy tank was quite unlike anything else seen within the game, or indeed Final Fantasy as a whole. Dinosaurs had featured throughout the 8-bit and 16-bit era, with the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Brachiosaurus serving as prominent examples, and Final Fantasy creators had also not been shy when including various mechanical enemies, but never before had there been any kind of mechanical dinosaur fusion. In this regard, the heavy tank was a fusion between a Triceratops and a tank, and it's because of this that the enemy has affectionately become known as either Tankceratops or Triceratank. And what's perhaps most interesting is that its three abilities, which all revolved around delivering physical damage to the player, were created to be unique to this enemy. Outside of the fringe encounter in Gongaga, the heavy tank also had the chance to appear within the third round of the battle square, but only after the tiny Brongo had been obtained and only before the high wind had been acquired. In terms of wider application, however, the heavy tank was quite useful. Those wanting to explore maximizing their character's stats would need different types of sources, and the heavy tank could be morphed into a power source which could be used to permanently raise a party member's strength stat by one. Based on all of these factors, it's going to be very interesting to see whether the heavy tank returns in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, but based on how they handled the Hell House, it wouldn't be too surprising at all to see it appear as a nasty boss in the Gungaga region. Final Fantasy VI also featured its fair share of unique enemies, with the Phantom Train standing out as a particular example, not least because of the infamous way it could be suplexed by Sabin. But if we're looking at enemies that were far more obscure, then focus has to be placed on the Alluring Rider, or Critic, as it was known in the original North American localization. This enemy appeared in the Dreamscape alongside a whole host of other strange creations, and it would always be encountered alongside either Pandora, which was a literal box, or Coco, who was described as being a sorceress who manipulated her foes through the power of love. Both of those enemies, however, had some kind of logical explanation, but the alluring rider was a bit more difficult to explain, as it was a half-naked lady riding on some kind of reptile. Looks would prove to be deceiving though, as the alluring rider could use sap seed to inflict the sap status, and also had access to dangerous lore spells such as doom and roulette. The other unique quality around this particular enemy is that she was considered to be too alluring when Final Fantasy VI launched in North America. 
As such, her outfit was modified so that she would show off a bit less flesh. As the narrative of Final Fantasy VIII developed, the world and everything relating to it became more and more fantastical. Such was the nature of these tonal shifts that it even led to the creation of some rather fascinating fan theories, with the surprise appearance of Mumbas being part of the School is Dead theory. But even though Final Fantasy VIII does feature plenty of weird and wonderful enemies, including the troublesome Propagators, perhaps the most obscure has to be the Slapper. This enemy can be found within Galbadia Garden during the Garden Clash sequence. The majority of the conflict centred around students and soldiers fighting against each other with no real whiff of anything supernatural taking place. But when navigating through to try and find Sorceress Adia, when venturing across the ice rink, the party would be attacked by hulking demi-human ice hockey players that would hit them with their sticks. The intriguing point about this particular enemy is that even though it was quite jarring and unexpected, the appearance of the slappers would be foreshadowed. When visiting Galbadia Garden for the first time, it was possible to visit the locker rooms connected with the ice rink. Inside, one of the students referenced the fact that the garden had demi-human athletes. The other expansion to the story was that the jersey worn by the demi-human ice hockey players ended up being made into a physical piece of merchandise. And that product, which revealed that their name was the Galbadian Bears, has since become one of the rarest and most sought-after pieces of Final Fantasy VIII merchandise. By the time Final Fantasy X had released, there were waves upon waves of strange enemies that had proliferated throughout the franchise. And in this regard, one of the strangest has to be the Demon Wall. After debuting in Final Fantasy IV, this enemy would then reappear in Final Fantasy VII, and the premise was that a demonic monster had been encased in a giant slab of stone. The Demon Wall would then wait to ensnare its foes or crush them. Final Fantasy X did not feature a demon wall, but it did feature a much smaller version called the Demonolith, and in many ways it was even stranger than the demon wall. Unlike the previous iterations of this enemy type, the Demonolith were regular enemies that could be found in either the Omega Ruins or inside Sin, and they were said to have been created from the fossilization process going wrong. In the context of Final Fantasy X, quite how such an event could occur was perhaps part of the puzzle, and why the Demonoliths were rather perilous. Standard melee attacks had the chance to inflict Curse or Zombie, and its breath ability, which was used in retaliation after being targeted three times, would have a high chance of causing petrification. Its other ability, Pharaoh's Curse, was also riddled with nasty enfeebling statuses. This would be used as a counter-attack and had the chance to inflict Darkness, Silence, Poison, and Curse. Given where they were faced and that if they were encountered inside the Omega Ruins they would have initiative, the Demonolith were pretty nasty enemies. And to add to the obscurity, a fossilized version of the Elveret boss from Final Fantasy VIII could randomly be found on their backs. Final Fantasy V featured plenty of humor and quirky gameplay mechanics, and sometimes those aspects overlapped, such as the Eggman summon and jobs such as the mine. But this notion also expanded through to the enemy roster, and one of the best examples has to be the Gaily Cat. This obscure enemy could only be found on the North Mountain as players embarked on their quest to obtain the Wind Drake, and it would appear alongside a handful of other enemies, one of which was the Headstone. And that in itself is a pretty obscure enemy, but it doesn't quite compare to the Gaily Cat. Appearing as a fluffy cat that was using manufactured wings to try and gain flight, it's difficult to envision how the Gaily Cat fits into the wider enemy roster. Often, the objective is to create something fearsome for the players to square off against, and the Gaily Cat just ended up looking rather adorable. The Gaily Cat would still pack a mild punch, however, thanks to its main ability called Cat Scratch. This would deal critical physical damage, but outside of that, the threat was limited. Beyond Final Fantasy V, perhaps due to the cuteness, the team working on Final Fantasy XIV implemented numerous iterations of the Gaily Cat, after being introduced via the Heavensward expansion as an enemy that appeared in numerous fates and dungeons, numerous minion variants were also created, as well as a delightful piece of headgear. Sticking with the subject of headgear, the next entry on our list comes from Final Fantasy XIII, where a venerable enemy type was turned into something much more unique. Flans have been appearing in Final Fantasy ever since the beginning, but they didn't get their iconic design until the second installment of the franchise. Since then, countless variants have been introduced, 
but Final Fantasy XIII took this notion to a whole other level through the introduction of military bread flans. Of the two variants that existed, we're going to focus on the flanata, which could be found in either Palamporum or the Palamecia. There were a few aspects that made this flan rather obscure in comparison to all the others that have been created over the years. For one, it was wearing a helmet, and this helmet had a siren on the top that would go off whenever it came into range of an enemy. When entering into a combat situation, instead of dealing some kind of evil magic damage that we'd been used to from flans, the flanator would instead deal mild physical damage, but they would spend the majority of their time using rescue to keep replenishing their health. This aspect would then be made more frustrating if the other variant of Flan was present, as the Flanborg was designed to be an offensive military model. Should the Flanborg be around, then Flanators would be tasked with keeping them alive for as long as possible. Perhaps due to the fun nature of the Flanator, they would then return in both Final Fantasy XIII 2 and Lightning Returns, and in XIII 2 they could even be recruited as a medic. That then brings us on to the last entry on this list, which is perhaps the most obscure, and that sentiment applies to both its design, but also its in-game application. Final Fantasy IX featured plenty of unique and interesting enemies, with the friendly monsters standing out in this regard, but it was another enemy which could be encountered in forests all over the world which was even more obscure, and that monster was the Ragtime Mouse. From a visual perspective, the Ragtime Mouse felt like something out of Alice in Wonderland, with accentuated physical features and a giant mouth complete with a single eyeball on a stalk appearing in place of a more traditional head. But what made this enemy perhaps more obscure than any other in the history of the franchise was that it forced the entire battle scene to be modified. Instead of attacking the monster, as players have been conditioned to do so for many years, the Ragtime Mouse instead asked a true or false question and the player would need to attack the true or false enemy type depending on what they believed to be the correct answer. In total, there would be 16 questions that would need answering, and they would all test the player's knowledge of the lore associated with Final Fantasy IX. Should all questions be answered correctly, the party could win up to 70,000 gil and a ton of experience, and in the more modern iterations, they would also unlock the trophy or achievement called Beating the Ragtime Blue. Now each of these encounters would leave a lasting impression for one reason or another, and we can't wait to see if any of them feature as the franchise continues to build out over the years. But we're certain there are plenty more obscure monsters out there, so why not let us know in the comments below which you felt deserved a place, and who knows, maybe we'll feature them in a future video. Of course, if you enjoyed this video then please feel free to hit the like button, and if you're a regular who hasn't subscribed, why not subscribe to the channel as well. There's no better time as we have a ton of long form content in the pipeline that we can't wait to share with all of you very soon. All right, everyone with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Patreon and YouTube member supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.